Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of Ride Now and Robinette here on the set. What's up, Jimbo? Doing good, buddy. Good. It's good to see you. Good. Welcome Give back. Knuckles, as my granddaughter says. Hmm. She just puts them up there, you know? Anyway, how's everybody doing? I hope you're doing great. Uh, we are ready to rock today. We have a great guest on, Dave Spitz. Played with Black Sabbath. Played with White Lion, Nuclear Assault. and I've shared the stage with him. Oh, you have? Yeah, we've done a little bit of jamming. Yeah, I met Dave at Marquee, I think. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy. He's, uh, he's, he's local. He's also uh, an attorney as well. And uh, he's a great guy. He's got great stories. What a history. Um, he comes from Queens, New York. He's got a big backstory there of uh, rock and roll and metal when it, you know, when it was really at its highlight in, uh, up in New York. And um, so we're looking forward to having him. I also want to say a quick shout out to Jason Sedowie. Sedowie. Um, Hello. Jason is a great guy, good, good dude. And without him, none of this really happens. So I just want to say thanks. It's always good to see him. He has a nice face. Did you, know, did you notice that or no? Did you ever, he has one of those faces it's, that you... It's just wonderful. It, it's not like this face. It's like it's you look wonderful. at his face and it makes you smile. Yeah. It's so, not like these two dudes, no. you know, but we're vintage. We're vintage, right? That's what I like to say. <laughs> we're, we're not old. He said to me a little while ago, wow, oh, this guy's old as dirt. No, <laughs> here it comes. Here's, here's the key. Yeah. You what can be as key? old as dirt, but I want to be above the dirt. I like that. Well, you know what, dude? You're a good guy. You're a hard worker. I think you're a beautiful young man. And I think you do. Whatever you do, you do it well. Back at you, baby. So back at good you. to be back here at Soundcheck. Um, our last episode was a huge success. Um, and uh, we it had good energy. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Definitely a lot of fun. And um, we're looking forward to having Dave here in South Florida at the Soundcheck Studios. So every time we do this, we always want to remind everybody, we really appreciate everybody, you know, watching, listening, even if you're listening for five seconds, five minutes, or the entire podcast, we appreciate you being part of what we do. This is what we want to do. We want to let everybody know what's going on in the music world here in South Florida and, and nationally as well. And uh, we've gotten some great feedback. So remember, if you get a chance, you get an opportunity, make sure you subscribe, hit on the button, and uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in. What are we going to absolutely going to wrap absolutely. about anything today? You know, I was thinking on the way here. Um, we always kind of do a little opening segment per our guests coming on. What was your favorite heavier bands in the seventies? Uh, well, first I would need the guitar, so I want to play a couple of those songs. Oh, I want to hear this because, because I. Uh, Okay, well, everybody, all the musicians that, that I know, all my friends and people that listen, and um, they all have their own backstory on how, you know, what music they started listening to right, when they were younger right. and how things progressed. I tell my friends all the time how fortunate we are to have grown up in that era because 20 years before that era or 20 years after that era, there, it, it, you can never repeat that. You can never repeat the Rolling Stones the Beatles, Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, Metallica, Led Zeppelin. all these heavy Led Zeppelin, all these hard rock kick-ass bands in that 60s, 70s, some 80s era, it'll never happen again. True. So for, for me, I think probably it started, believe it or not, when I was very young with my sisters listening to vinyl, um, a lot of folk music. It started with me. I mean, even some of the, a lot of the piano stuff, like the Elton John and the Cat Stevens and Simon and Garfunkel, Loggins and Messina, um, uh, whatever it may be. I, I, those are the first few albums that I remember getting turned on to that stimulated me was those early America. acoustic. America was huge. In, you uh, know? Who was that other group? Uh, oh, God, there's so many uh, of there's, them. There's hundreds. England, um, England, Dan, and John. Simon Ford and Garfunkel Foley. was big. You know. But then, you know, that was when I was very young. That's called and then more it, of the acoustic folk. You know. Yes, and I and I and to this day I could listen to it, um, but then you know you start to you know your ears open wide open and you know going through middle school and you start uh, I mean Kiss Kiss was huge yeah. for me, for some reason I mean it wasn't just me it was obviously millions of people all over the world and now I just listen to um, Paul Stanley's audio book. Oh, how is that? Oh my God, it must have been 50, 60 chapters in it. Took three or four days of listening, but it was pretty neat. The backstory. Um, I met the them. With, I met them without their makeup 
early oh, on. Oh, no kidding. I think it was the first tour, or one of them, they were opening for Aerosmith. Oh, and no Aerosmith, kidding. Aerosmith at the time, I believe, I mean, I wasn't old enough to drive, so I went with some older people. Um, I think they had like a big A behind, up on the stage with like lights that you would have in your, look like floodlights from your house. And that was their stage setup back yeah, then. Yeah. But we waited and um, we, we got to go backstage. Peter Chris came out first. I never forget, he was in this terry cloth looking jumpsuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of just walked by us. Uh, Gene Simmons was, was off. I remember thinking he had to be the business guy because he was off wandering around with the promoter. But Paul Stanley came and s talked to us, I would say, for 15 minutes. No makeup, no any. Uh, any. Ace Freely, as we were walking out of the place to the exit door with Paul, we saw Ace Freely was opening Heineken bottles on the back of the limo, the bumper. I was maybe 15, 14, 15. It was cool. It was cool, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those are the memories that yeah, you don't but forget. But Paul Stanley was really cool as shit. Yeah, we I, I like, was a big, big Kiss fan. And then, you know, slowly moved on to, you know, other things, you know, depending on who you're hanging out with, people turning you on to records. I mean, obviously, I got turned on to my first uh, Van Halen album. Probably I was my freshman year, eighth grade, freshman year, maybe. Um, you know, and then Black Sabbath, of course, was huge for me. Technical Ecstasy, Master of Reality. I mean, I was like, woo! You turn that on, you're going to take a ride. You know, then yeah. heaven and hell, uh, and then of course, you know all the uh, the spinoffs. You know, not spinoffs. I liked I Deep, liked Deep Purple a lot. Yeah, man. I thought Deep Purple. I list. I had definitely records from them. Uh, Thin Lizzy, I thought was great. Um, every Zeppelin record. I was I was uh, big Maiden when I was 15, 16 too. Went through that Maiden era with Paul Diano. You know, they were the, the first singer, mm -hmm. um, and then Bruce came in later on. But I was a huge Maiden fan at one point. We were covering a bunch of those songs, of course, Priest. Um, so yeah, I, uh, Turbo Lover, all that good stuff. And going, I worked at the Sportatorium for a couple of years. Oh, when so I was you a saw kid. a lot So that of was shows. maybe uh, um, was a dirty job, but you know, uh, I couldn't be any happier being around that atmosphere. I might have been 16, 17 year old, seventeen. Yeah. My mother, I remember my mother was not crazy about that gig because um, she had to drive me out there. What was your... All, all the way at the end yeah, of Hollywood all the way Boulevard. out there. What was your best concert, you think, at the Sportatorium? Because I know a lot of viewers our age have been to the Sportatorium. God, that's a times. tough one, man. If I could... Mm, there are so many. I know. It's hard. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Aerosmith, Draw the Line. I mean, you know... Uh, there's so many. Rush, fa Rush, farewell the Kings. Didn't didn't when Sammy Hager first played with Van Halen, the Sportatorium wasn't the Sportatorium still there then? You know, because I remember uh, seeing Hart there at the Sportatorium as one of my yeah, last shows yeah. there. Because I remember the singers had these mats and they would walk up on the mat and like their mic came on. Like, in other words, I don't know if it was because of feedback or what, but their, their mics were never on. They walked up on this mat. I don't know if it triggered it or I'm just imagining it, but I remember we all talked about it. We were like, is their mic coming on? When they go on? Anyway, I, I want to say, where was the first concert with Sammy Hager and Van Halen? Because I remember he didn't sing Jump, but he brought some of the Dolphins up, I think. If I, You know, I, I watched all Torian? those interviews. And their first show together was some big, giant show. It wasn't right. like Right, no, no, no. It, I think it was out, because like, I had a friend at Warner Brothers out there, and he told me about it. He went to I it. I can't remember. He put me on the spot, but if I would have looked but it at up. at the Sportatorium, yeah. I thought they played, not their first show, their first tour together. I got you. Yeah. First time they were out. I want to say we went to that, and I think it was at the Sportatorium. I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah, I was, but I was a... I remember seeing Danny Black Island. Sabbath with Night Ranger opening. Was that at the Sunrise yeah, I, Musical I, Theory? I saw them, uh, I didn't see them, but the Women and Children First and Sabbath was at the Sportatorium. That's when I got cuffs put on me. Oh, we heard that story. Yeah, yeah, but that was, that was, Jimbo, a, that was a baby. Jimbo going to jail. We're going to write a yeah, song about that Yeah, we didn't actually go one. to jail, but yeah, I got the cuffs put on me. <laughs> you know, we were all kids. Where everybody was sneaking in, jumping over the wall. Everybody wanted to save a buck. Nobody had the money, even though it was $6.50 to see Van Halen and Black Sabbath. <laughs> Oh my God! And my mother came and picked me up. Oh God! What a disaster <laughs> that was. But um, yeah, so I, I got so many influences. You know, as you as you go on, and then things start to change when you get older. And year after year after year, 
you hear and see different things that you get turned on to. But the Black Sabbath stuff was just so, so heavy, you know? Those guitars and Tony Iommi and Geezer Butler, what a rhythm oh, yeah. section, Bill Ward. I mean, you know, it's life-changing for me, but... Um, my heaviest yeah. show down here, I think, was one of my first shows I ever went to. I think my dad took me and my brother to see Canned Heat at FAU. Wow. And then our first real concert was Grand Funk Railroad in Blood Rock. Your brother mentioned that one. Yeah. And that's, what's his name? Mark Farner. Mark Farner. Mark Farner. Yeah. We were Ooh, like, that we were sitting, I, you know, it might've been Pirates Roll. We were sitting in ble actually bleachers. And I remember, I, you know, all these people were under blankets on the ground doing everything you can imagine. And me and my brother were just sitting there like little kids going, what in the hell yeah, yeah. is going on? Mark Farner walked out. Put that arm up in the air with all that hair and the whole place went ape shit. And we were like, oh, we're definitely Dude, doing he, this. We're man, definitely doing this. He just kicked ass. It was scary. He didn't stop. He was a front man, front man with a guitar like yep. nobody's business. Yep. He had that Epiphone with the duct tape over the hole for feedback. They were playing through. Oh, what were those big amps they used? West amps. They were guitar amps and bass amps. Uh -huh. And funk real. Anyway, we are going to have a great show with Dave today. We're just kind of reminiscing about some of the heavier groups and some of the locations we went to see them. Glad you're all tuning in and uh, stay with us. We'll be back in a little bit with Dave Spitz. Look forward to it. Take care. Hey, hey. folks, welcome back. Here we are at Soundcheck with Ridenauer. And Robinette, good to see you, Keith. What's happening? We have our guest with us. Dave. Very excited. Dave. Let's have a, let's have a Thanks, everybody. Good to yeah, see you guys. Dave Spitz. Rockin'. Good to see you, my friend. And it's Absolutely. my pleasure Welcome. to have you. And Welcome. thank you for taking your time out of your day. My pleasure, uh, man, to be with you guys. We know you don't live too far down the road, right? You no, live? I live in Deerfield, Boca area. Yeah, okay. just right down the road a bit. So it wasn't that bad, and we really appreciate it. Um, we're really excited. We got such a buzz going on. As soon as I mentioned on the internet that you were going to be part of our podcast. People got excited. I got some messages through Messenger. I got texts. Yeah. Um, people want to ask questions. They all want to get up in your business, you know, because the history is there. Right. Um, the first thing I could say before we even go, because there's so many questions that we have, we're going to try to get most of them out. Um, isn't it crazy that in this area, in South Florida, when you think of rock or hard rock, when I was a kid, because I grew up here, um, I know you grew up in the Queens, you grew up, you grew up north, but when you grew yeah. up down here, it was kind of like Queens where there was place on every block to play, like heavy. You could go with any tons of clubs and hear wide open guitars, marshals, metal, cover bands. SVTs, come on. SVTs, yeah. come on. You know, Ampegs, yeah. whatever, you know. Right, thank and, you. And now, uh, because I'm, we're still in the music business, yeah. um, let's, let's face it, there's a small handful of places now, isn't there? Yeah, there's very, there's quite a few less uh, places than there was even uh, going back 15, 20 years. I've been down here since law school, since 96, so 27 years. You've been here obviously much longer right. than that. You know the scene down here uh, much more than me because you've been doing it longer here. But uh, you're right that there's, there's only a, a, a kind of a handful of places that do our kind of heavy metal hard rock, whatever you want to call it, you know, you don't have to label everything, but there, there, there's less places to play, really, for sure. And um, what people, let's, let, we're going to start from the beginning and we're going to move through because when you started, I'm going to guess uh, late 60s, early 70s, I mean, that's when, that's when it was hot. There was so much going on. So tell us a little bit about, you're, you're from Forest Hills, right? I was born in Forest Hills, Queens, outside of New York City. But uh, when I was five, we moved outside the city. My father was an attorney in Manhattan. Uh, my mother was a teacher. I come from you know professional family in that sense, um, intellectually wise. But we moved, when I was five, when my brother was born, we moved to Rockland County, which is like original suburbs, about a half hour north of the George Washington Bridge. So I grew up in Rockland County. It's actually a town called Havistraw, right. which people might not know, but they might know Stony Point, Orangeburg, Muncie. You know, yeah. it's very famous for the uh, Revolutionary War. George Washington, you know, long story, whatever. It's, it's famous for there. But we also, since I was two in 1960, we had a house up in White Lake, New York, in the Catskills. So people Vacation, know that. Yeah, we had a summer home up there since I was two. And that's interesting 
because the original Woodstock in 1969 That's right. was a mile and a half from my house. The guy who's landed Wait, was on- Catskills? Catskills, yeah, 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 White yeah. Lake, New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That no. was called Woodstock. I mean, we won't get too far off the track Yeah, yet. yeah, 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 that's but okay. But it was yeah. called Woodstock because the festival was supposed to be in Woodstock, New York, where Todd Rundgren, you know, yeah, people yeah. know he had a, a studio there. Anyway, but soon before the concert, hundreds of thousand people, thousands of people started, you know, buying tickets. So right before the show, a couple of months before the, the concert, they actually moved the site, the venue, to White Lake, New York, to this guy Max Gasker's farm. It was like a natural amphitheater. It goes up on a hill. Everybody's seen that. I'm talking about the original Woodstock, not okay. the ones later. Not 69. August not of 1969. 69. August 1969. So anyway, long story short, the guy whose land it was on, Max Gasker, he was my milkman. He used uh, to drive up and deliver milk in the yeah, early they used 60s. to put it on the yeah. front there with the yeah, yeah. And a, and little little, kid, a little the, metal the, thing. The grass. <laughs> so anyway, it's an interesting part That's, of my history because Woodstock was right down the, the street right. from my somehow. So I really didn't grow up in New York City. Right. We grew up a little bit outside the city, and then the Catskills. We spent a lot of time there. So cool. you you were there through your teenage years. I, we had that school? house like fifty years. So when when was the first time that like, what 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 hit you to start? picking up the guitar, either bass guitar, whatever it was. Tell us a little about how that started and what like kind of, what in, were influences you had at that time. Okay, so backing up just a little, uh, I, I was just, you know, luckily and, and born naturally musically inclined. Right. I played uh, clarinet, classical clarinet since second or third grade. I was classically trained on that. Uh, my parents, you know, were music lovers. They My mother used to play a little piano, but not really. My father, if you'd ask him, what do you play? I play the phonograph. But music was always on in my house 24 hours a day. I grew up with that. It's in my soul. I was born with it. And I was just, you know, gifted enough to have a lot of natural talent, you know, musically. But I was classically trained with clarinet. And then that eventually went into, you know, jumping ahead when I used to have this guy, Pee Wee, his name is Steve Weiss, and, and the people up in the, in the mountains will, will appreciate this. <laughs> and the people that know me, you yeah, know, yeah, he named everybody. Originally, I was named Piggy, and then he changed my name, changed it to Beast. Changed to the Beast. Yeah, so everybody wow, knows that's where that came as the from. Beast, right? How did he come up with that? Though? He this? just named me one day, just, you know, and then it, it became more true over the years yeah. because my hair just grows from every pore. Right. I got a deep bass voice. It's the way I play. I attack yeah. the bass, you know. Yeah, 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 We've jammed yeah, yeah. together. Yeah. So the Beast just really fits me. And I've had that way before any of these football guys that call themselves the Beast, whatever. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. It was I tried the that. name with some other people. But you know what? I, I always thought you got the name from playing. It's it was really from I playing. I really did. But I was, I was playing. You know, I, I did start playing bass. So anyway, so from clarinet, this guy Pee Wee used to babysit for me. He was several years older. And he turned, at a very young age, he, t he turned me on to Cream, which was my all-time major influence, yeah. among many yeah, others Bruce. I know. Jack, Jack Bruce. Bruce was, my, the reason I play bass is because of Jack Bruce. No kidding. Yeah, that's my original See, that's the idol, you if you want to wow. say idol. So, but there's, there's other ones too, we can get into that if you yeah. want to know. But Jack Bruce and Pee Wee, the guy who named me Beast, he turned me on to Cream, Hendrix, Zeppelin, Zappa, you know. Is this before Johnny you picked up the bass? This is before. This is just so, listening. Yeah, he just turned me yeah. on to all this music at so a very young So you started listening, age. that's so when So then you... I was like, I started listening. It became, you know, part of my my soul, my, my, my reason for existence. And then I kept, you know, telling my dad, I'm like, Dad, I want to play guitar. So he brought me home like a cheapo, you know, like a twelve dollar acoustic guitar from Lafayette. I don't know if you guys Lafayette yeah, yeah, was yeah, like yeah, yeah. was yeah. like Sears back yeah. then. And I took like four or five lessons at a local place in Samsondale, which was, you know, close to where I lived there in in uh, in Havistro in Rockland County. And I was like, you know what, the hell with this. I want to play bass. I want to be like Jack Bruce, man. I want an EB3. Right. And I kept bothering my dad. And I used to I used to hide the, the Gibson catalogs next to his next to the bed. So yeah. he would keep seeing the bass, and eventually he came home and he and he brought me actually, he actually brought me an Ibanez, which back then was like a no, a no name right. wave. It was like a copy of a Fender Precision. Right. The first fret was like three inches. It was like out here. But then I kept bugging him, and eventually he took me to Sam Ash in White Plains, which is near our house there, you know, a little north of, of Manhattan, and he bought me. It was actually an EVO. 
I really want an EB3, but he bought me an EBO. And then a year or two later, this is a funny story. I wrote a letter as a little kid. I was like 12, 13, maybe. I had an EBO. You yeah. know, I had the one pickup, but I wanted the Jack Bruce model. Right. So oh, I wrote a letter, great. a handwritten letter to Gibson. I want to turn my EBO into an EB3. Can you can you sell me the rest of the electronics? And they did. And I went in, I chiseled out the base. I had no idea what I was doing. I was with a hammer and a chisel, and I turned the EBO into an EB3, and I still have that base today. Well, you know, when you started well, talking about Jack Bruce, story. I was going to ask you, do you have an EB3? <laughs> yeah. And it's not the one he played. It's right. actually a, a 72 or 73. It's a slotted neck. You know, he had a bunch of them. He had the longer neck. Right. You know, this one was actually a short scale bass. I didn't know the difference. All I knew was I had an EBO. I turned it into EB3. And I got so good just teaching myself. Because remember, I had, you know, natural training, you know, from the clarinet. But that had nothing to do with the guitar. Right, right. You know, I had a couple of lessons. And I had a couple of neighbors that this guy, Jay Riley, that played guitar. And we used to jam together. But I just really, you know, it was a natural thing for me. I really just picked it up and I started just teaching myself. And back then, you know, we just had cassettes. No internet. Real, no internet. internet. Come on. We had reel-to-reels. <laughs> so you, you know, would but, slow the reel-to-reel -reel down had to learn so, the parts. I had more stereo equipment than anybody you ever met. Because my father was a lawyer. Half the people couldn't pay him the clients. They gave him equipment. We had, <laughs> oh, like, that's we had so many stereo, you have no <laughs> idea. So I had all these reel-to-reels, and we used to record from the LP, from the vinyl LP. We used to record the songs and the albums onto reel-to-reel, -reel, and then we would play it back half speed and figure out all the exactly. words. Exactly, yeah. Right, so that's how we did it. We didn't have any pitch shifters. Yeah. You know, you guys, we were similar in age, so you yeah, know what yeah. I'm talking about. So that's, I'm, I'm blasting through a lot of these early years, you know, because you want to get to a lot of stuff. Tell the people who don't understand the, about the EO, the EB, the, the, the guitar. EB, EBO 1 EB. and 2 and 3. Well, the, yeah. e, the Gibson EBO was the same thing. It's like an SG bass. Yep. Everybody knows SG okay, guitars. Right, right. Tony Iommi, Todd Rundgren, Clapton used to play them in, yep. you know, in the yep. early days. That's just called an SG, and they called it an EBO. Electric bass zero, it was dash zero. Okay. Okay, so the, the, the EBO just had the one giant humbucker. Uh, pickup. Ah, it was yeah. a monster. Crappy bridge, yeah. you know, just basic electronics. There was no active, no batteries, you know. It was yeah. just a, a passive instrument, <laughs> but it only had the one pickup. But right, Jack right. Bruce's bass, the EB3, had the big pickup, and it had a little skinny pickup, and then had a more advanced electronic system with like a, a three- or four-way tone switch and a volume, volume, tone, tone, you know, and the rest of it was basically the same thing. It just had a second pickup and that, but I wanted to be like Jack Bruce. And so I, call, I, I like I said, I ended up, you know, they Doing mailed yourself, me this stuff together, and I yeah. chopped away at it. I, the pickup was in the wrong spot. That's some old school shit right yeah, there, buddy. Cool. Right. So, I got so, out my so, chisel so, and so I chopped the So now you have your bass, yeah. you're listening. You're learning songs. Right. Now it's time. Let's get a rock and roll band. You have to meet some cats. Exactly. And start playing, let's say, in the garage, the warehouse. You find a guitar player. You find a drum, right. one of your first bands, cover band, I'm assuming. Yep. And you try to start getting gigs going. You become 15, 16, 17. You got to play some local clubs. Mm -hmm. Get us, move us forward a couple of years and tell us about some of the cats that you played with okay. and some of the, the cover bands and how it uh, excelled into, you know, into uh, the later years. Later okay. years. Yeah. So like I said, I, I had an early start and I was just naturally gifted. Thank God, you know, whatever. And you know, there was this other guy, Stephen August, they called him Augie. And this guy was like, but the hottest guitar, it was way older. I don't remember. Several years. Remember when you're like 13, someone who's like 15, 16, yeah, 17. Yeah, they're older. That's a like a lifetime older. <laughs> they don't even want to talk to you, let alone play with you. Right, right. But this guy, Augie, was the, the greatest guitar player in like five counties. And my other friend, Jay Riley, who played guitar, who lived four houses down, we used to jam. We were to Cream, Hendrix, Johnny Winter, all these Zeppelin, all these. And we used to jam and had the real to real early song. And he was friends with with this guy, Dennis Zagarisi, they call him Zag. Zag was best friends. I can't it's, remember, I'm remembering it's, it's all this. It's so New York. <laughs> this it is, is totally great. New York. So Zag was best friends with the older guy, Augie. So they, they, they jam with me and they're like, you gotta see this guy, Dave, the beast. You yeah. know, he's like a little kid, but he plays, got a Gibson EB3, <laughs> and he plays amazing. So they started, I went to his house to meet him. I was all nervous one time. And he's playing all this, like, amazing stuff, and he had girls coming in and out of the place, you know? And he was, yeah. you know, I don't want to get too lewd. 
on your hey, program, but yeah, yeah. You know, oh, this, this is the guy. program to do it. Yeah. Is he? Okay. Oh yeah, we got to get dirty on this program. Yeah, oh, buddy. Okay, I didn't what do you know. think? Okay. We got subscribers. They want to see the show. Okay. So, well, okay, I got so, a lot of dirt. I got yeah, yeah, a lot no, of dirt. That's, that's okay. So I'm just fucking anyway, up. he had girls coming and going. I went to be, and he was like, "Hey, nice to meet you." So we ended up jamming a little bit, me and him, and 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 uh, the other guys. Just he had a little Astro MPEG Astro something. I forget the name of it. And we just jammed like me and him through his amp. We both plugged in, and he like, couldn't believe how good I played. So then we started setting up jams, because I lived in, in a house. Uh, it was like a townhouse thing in this big circular community called Village on the Green. We had a carport. We didn't have a garage. So when you pulled in the driveway, it's like a townhouse, yeah. right? But it wasn't. It was open. So it was like there wasn't a garage door. You just pulled in. It was because it was cover. like it was a cover yeah. of it. Yeah, it we had a, one of those. There was a yeah, room yeah, above. Yeah. So we started setting up jams in my little carport. Now my mother, like I said, my parents were total music fanatics, but they originally, I did want to play drums. My mother wouldn't let me play drums. Too loud, David, too loud. But she got lost anyway, because I ended up having everybody play with all the drums over in my house. Right, right. Okay, so Augie used to come over in the little carport in my garage, and we used to jam, and all the people from all of the, the community. The neighborhood would come neighborhood hear the music. Come over. Yeah. So we used to jam there, and then we started playing like some high school parties and, and uh, just people's private parties. And there were like a lot of these older bands, guys that were like more seasoned guys that I used to go watch that played at the high school and so, not clubs. I was way too young. No, yeah, yeah, I, I, right, These right, were just right. parties, high school parties, you know. We used private, to love those parties, man. High schools or whatever. Yeah. That's where I really honed my stuff. So the first band after the thing with Augie, then I started meeting, you know, a couple of years later, guys of my own age, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. So my first band was called Rockside. And it had me and Jack Sino, this other guy, Paul Martino, who could actually sing Ozzy, and this drummer, Ira Sokolsky. I remember, I actually remember their names. Ira lived in my neighborhood. Me and him used to jam. We were really into Jethro Tull. I didn't mention that before. We yeah. used to jam on Tull. And we had another guy that lived in our development, a big heavy guy called Harris Pickus. That was his name. And he was really good, but he was like a weirdo. And so me, him, and Ira used to jam, but I ended up forming this, this other band called Rockside. It was really my first band. And we used to play at all these different private parties, and we would play at the high school. And that, that was really my first band. We used to do Hendrix, Sabbath, Johnny Winter, Alice Cooper. So would this would be, uh, what, late 60s? No, no, no. So this is like 70, 71, 72, maybe. Okay. You know, or like So eight, then you're ninth playing with these cover kind of bands. Thing. Eventually you become of age. I'm guessing back then, 18 might have been uh, old enough to start drinking cocktails and playing at some of the bars, right? 18. Yeah, well, I, I skipped second grade. I was like a smarty kid. So I, I, I got to college when I was 17. I was a year younger. So when I went to college. So you continued your education. Oh, absolutely. Just I because never stopped my education. I've never, ah. the one thing, here's the thing, good question. Yeah. My parents, like I said, they were total music lovers. They recognized my talent from a very young age. Huh. So they were always behind me, but they were also professionals. Lawyer, and, and my mother was a teacher. Yeah. David, we, you're great with music. You go, you have to continue your education. That's the most important thing wow, in beautiful. the world. So you can do, always do your music, but you must continue education. Maybe you'll go to law school, you know, eventually one day or whatever. But they never pressured me. They just said, you, you have to continue education no matter what. But they were always totally, absolutely supportive hmm. of, of my music. That's great. As long as you stayed in school. They would, forget it, I would have been dead by now. They, you know, they, they, they would never let me quit school. And I am a, a total, absolute believer in education and music education. I, I teach at, at different schools around the world when people ask me. I've done School of Rock. I do the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. I've got right. instructional videos. So you, you always give back throughout your... I have to. I'm going, right from our interview, mm -hmm. I'm going to teach a bass lesson today. Right from oh, when we leave Oh, I didn't here. know you offer yeah. private lessons. I, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting more students. Anybody out there? I'm looking, uh, I am looking for more uh, students right now. Look, I'm not going to be here forever. We're all, you know, human and, and mortal, you know. I want to yeah. keep passing it on. Look, I have instructional videos that have been out since, since 87, 88.
I had over a hundred students at one time in, in Los Angeles wow. after Sabbath when I lived there. I mean, half the time they don't show up, but whatever. Yeah. That's why you got to have luck. And yeah. uh, love teaching. I have to pass it on. I have so many things that, you know, because we can get into this with some other questions, but rock and roll is a very simple art form. When you compare it with not even painting and that kind of thing, but just music wise, jazz, classical, I mean, that takes much, much more knowledge and experience and, discipline and technique too. You know, and it's, discipline. It's, it's okay, funny, so yeah. nothing yeah. against rock and roll. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. It's a simple, you know, the basics, the fundamentals is the word of rock and roll is simple. But because it's been done so many millions and millions of times, what are you going to do to make it different? What are you going to do to make it special? Absolutely. It's all about style. You must create your own style. I like and that. That's the Remember hardest. Remember that one for that's you. That's the hardest kids thing to do. Up. You yeah. got to steal from everybody else that you love. I've been doing it for fifty years. You got to steal riffs and ideas and and, and make it your own thing. Stage pre whatever. You got to make it your own. That's why when people come see me, look, I never toot my own horn. You guys know me. We know yeah. each other a yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. But when we're on an interview, it's important for people to understand. You have to make it your own, and you got to be special. When I get on stage, you've never seen anybody play bass like me. Right. I'm not saying I'm the greatest or anything, but you've never seen that before. Well, you've, you've created your own style. I've created the yeah. beast style. Yeah, I'm going to get into that later because okay. i got some things to share. But okay, so we got a little off track there. No, no, so no. That's that was okay. the first so band. Then I went to college. You went to college. So the, while you were in college, uh, you went to college upstate too, right? I went to uh, State University of New York at Geneseo, which is right. up Rochester, in between Rochester and Buffalo, way and, upstate New and York. And while you were in school, you continued to play. Absolutely. Were you playing with cats at, at the college? I, I met or cats. You, or did you keep playing with your old buddies? No, no, I was gone. I was eight, seven hours so away. So now, now we're getting into uh, your, uh, your, we're getting your getting later to teenage years. 75. 75. 75. So, so you met some cats at, at college. Right. I, did I, I did you dig earlier. in deeper? Did you dig in deeper? Did you did you hone your chops? Did you have your bass in your dorm? Were you just thumping? Because I, uh, that's where I'm wondering <laughs> where those years, because let's face it. Yeah. You play in the bass and then you play the bass. Right. So there's that time where someone recognized something special was going on because yeah. there's a hundred million bass players. That's but true. then there's that something. Now I'm grum, right. but I don't want to jump the gun. So now you're in college, you're playing with cats in college, still mm -hmm. playing in cover bands. Uh, exactly, that's what happened. I, I, I'm there for an education, like I said, education is, but I'm doing my music. Um, soon after I, I you know, got to college, I met some guys right away. It was a band called Freeway. They were already, already playing. A couple mm. of the guys who were enrolled in school, a couple weren't, were just local guys. And uh, they had a problem with the bass player, and they kicked him out. I met this guy, Eric Ferrari, who was a great guitar player, a big, tall guy with a mustache, an Italian guy. He was there at, at college. We met somewhere uh, on campus, and he says, look, you know, I, I heard, I, I used to jam like acoustic. I had a couple of acoustic things going because yeah. I, I used yeah, to play yeah. a little little acoustic guitar and a little lead back in the day. I don't do yeah, much, yeah, 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 you know yeah. what I mean? So we played at a couple of local, local bars, you know, and, and it's a funny story. We tried calling the band after the rain and then everyone, they ripped the sign off the door and they changed it to Spitz and the Dudes. Right. This is an acoustic <laughs> thing. So anyway, through the acoustic thing, you know, just me and a couple of acoustic guys, guys, this guy, Eric, came up and he, he saw me. He, said, he goes, oh, I heard you really play bass. I'm like, yeah. I ended up joining Freeway. Now, these guys were playing two to three to almost four nights a week. About three nights then. It became, oh, no became four nights a week. Bars? Bars, Bars you, colleges, high schools. You already had an agent, these guys, because they were established a year Freeway. or so. Freeway. Freeway. I well, love that. Let thing. me ask you this. So when yeah. you join with these guys, they've already, they're already playing two, three, they four were times playing. a week. But did you did you have to learn more commercial type rock, classic rock stuff, or were you able to keep doing Cream and Hendrix and everything like that at all these bars well, and clubs? Good question. They were they were doing some pretty heavy stuff. That's why I, I kind of was drawn to them. Sure, sure. I mean, we did you know whatever we did the heaviest stuff that was popular okay. then. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, which is what Deep Purple, Deep Grand Deep Funk Purple, Railroad, Grand Funk. I mean, uh, it, it went even beyond ben that. Lizzie you and, know. No, we never really did Thin Lizzy, although I love them. I, I can't even remember. Yeah, you know, yeah, we yeah, did yeah. like everything. Yeah. That we, but I kept pushing for Blue Oyster Cult and Sabbath because I was into Sabbath and Blue Oyster Cult, and those guys were too. And then we used to do like, I can't even remember, bro. I can't even remember. Yeah, so you had the. Yeah, we, I just was curious. Popular is stuff, you? 
but we always mixed it in. Right, with the with heavy. A little heavy, heavier stuff that the other local bands didn't play. Right. Okay, and the other interesting point of this, Freeway, which is from there, everybody knows Billy Sheen, we're, we're friends and brothers, yeah. you know, he was in the original Talis. He was from Buffalo. Yeah, and yeah. We, and yeah. my school was near Rochester. So we would play Friday and Talis would play Saturday or vice versa. We played all the same clubs in the whole tri-state area. So me and Billy go back way. I mean, Billy's like an amazing, you know, you yeah, guys yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Different style right. than me. Right. He's Billy. Talis I'm the beast. Is old school, man. I remember that name when I was in high school. So I'm yeah. just saying, because people that are watching this, you know, oh, you're from upstate, you know, so they will know because me, me and Billy come from the same, you know, scenes yeah. back up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But we started playing and I was going full time to college at the time. And then it, I think after the second, no, in the third year, we got so popular. We had an agent, Peter Monticelli, who booked all the even bigger bands than us. The bands called Duke Jupiter and uh, I can't remember the names. You guys down here, people wouldn't know. Hey, but they were really a lot of Long Islanders. They down were here, though. really popular bands. In, you know, this, so this guy Peter Monticelli, they called him the Pelican. Shout out to Peter because he comes down. Everybody's here. got a nickname. It's like watching yeah. the Sopranos. Well, he's like a Pelican. A little buzzy, you know. <laughs> he, he, he's a snowbird. He comes down here. Uh, like 10 minutes from here. Anyway, he, he we saw how good we are. We had a great singer, this guy, Mike Freeway, who, who rest his soul. Oh, so they named the band after him? Yeah, well, he I, passed away. Mike okay, Lindsay, got it. whatever. I don't know how they got the name. Anyway, okay, I love that name, Anyway, by the he way, died Freeway, a couple but, of years ago. Okay. But anyway, we got we got to be so, to wrap this part up, because we've got a lot more to cover. You know, we got so popular, and the band was so good. We had really, I mean, we put on a great show, and I was just becoming more of a beast then. That was really your question, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was really honing my craft. It was the first real gigging band, you know, other than just a few high school places. The first gigging band that I was in, we were playing steady. So oh. in the, my third year, I dropped down to part-time status in the college because we were playing three, four nights a week. And I continued. I never stopped. I kept going. I went like one extra semester, and I graduated in 1979. But we we just kept going, and the band kept getting bigger, bigger. So eventually, I'm like, you know, what's going on? We got to write a couple of songs. I was like impatient. I'm like, okay, well, you know, we've already done this cover thing. I was already looking to the future. Although I always wanted to go to law school, and that was my plan. That was never out of my mind, law school. But I'm like, I've got talent. I'm better than anybody the other guys that I've seen that I play around. This band's good. What's next? What's happening next? So what this is, is the so difference we, between, if I didn't interrupt the you, guys. this is a different, well, not just you, but in general, people who have had success in their lives in, well, as I say, in music, there is the difference of the people who are just content and happy with where they're at. Or and they want to get somewhere else. Saying, okay, I feel like I have bigger aspirations, absolutely, I don't absolutely. belong here, something has to be bigger and better. Not everybody has that. You're so exactly now right. you get this, now let's move forward. Right. So now Freeway, you wanna get this fucking thing rolling, things are not rolling like you want it to be. What's your What's your next well, move we, we, we were, I, I wrote a couple songs, me and the guitar player wrote a couple songs. We actually printed them on a, on a, on a 45, we sold them to the shows, nothing was happening. I, was to, I got to a point where I was on just a 45. Like, a 45. For your, yeah. for your folks out there Those don't know what a 45 really is. Yeah. <laughs> it's called uh, Streamline on one side, yeah. and the other side was Out on the Road. Me and Eric wrote the song. Do you have a copy of that I in your house? I actually do. I actually you, do. You actually have yeah. the vinyl, the 45. I actually do, yeah. Oh, my there's, God. There's, okay, go ahead. There's very few of those in existence. Okay, I, go ahead. I've got one. I don't know if it's worth anything, but just hang you on know, to it. You know, when we, I die, you can sell it on eBay. I have a 45. Me and my brother recorded at Mike Panera's studio when we he was 14 and I was 17. And yeah. I still have the 45. The 45. And you know what? Just to, yeah. Because you mentioned this, just to back up. When I was way earlier with the Rockside guys that we talked about, we actually, this guy, Jack Sino, the guitar player, he knew this other guy that lived up in Stony Point, which is like uh, like a more hick kind of area in Rockin' County. Anyway, he was a country guy, and his name was Pete Rose, like the baseball guy, uh, right? Uh, that was his name. So Jack used to jam with this guy, and this guy wanted to cut this country record. So they brought me along because I played with the guitar player, Jack, and we went to this guy's house and then we recorded this country record. On one side was Big Busted Woman, 
<laughs> I'm not kidding. It. This is absolutely true. And the other side was, I don't want anyone around me. Total country. A, a cover? No. He oh, wrote both the original. Song. Okay, right, uh, right, right. Original. And I played the EB3. I remember sitting in this guy's house recording. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. <laughs> and I have one of those around somewhere. Country. So that was actually the first record I ever did. It was like 12. Uh -huh. So getting back with Freeway, we did this song. Nothing was happening. I was like, you know, I, I got to do something. So all You graduate? Sudden, did you graduate? No, I was still, I graduated, yeah. but I still stayed up there. My parents were like, what are you doing? You know, it's time for law school. I'm like, well, I'm still doing music. You know, I'm making a couple of bucks. We're very popular up here. So my parents had a little bit of patience, which is interesting. So this was, I graduated in 79. So I, I was up there maybe a year later and a cup, couple of really nice, I mean, you said you wanted to get dirty. Oh, of course. We, oh. we, we love oh, dirt, bro. I, I had so many girlfriends. They were coming and going. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Had, they used to come in the broom closets. <laughs> and people like... I usually don't tell these stories, but you got me going. Listen, uh, listen, because, listen. Have, have a you sip. you got me some Glenn Livet going here. Saying, wait, here's what I want you to do real quick. Take a sip. Okay. I want everybody to stick around. We're just going to take two minutes and uh, throw our sponsors in there real quick. We're going to come back in two seconds with Dave Spitz. Let's have a hand for Dave yeah. Spitz. The Beast. All right, I'll be right yeah. back. Stick around. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Soundcheck with Ryan Now and Robinette. Just a quick shout out uh, to my band, uh, Southern Blood. Um, we've got quite an extensive tour set up for 2024, playing all over South Florida. You can check in at southernbloodband.com. Southernbloodband.com is our website. You can go to our Facebook page, Southern Blood Band, or you can go to our Instagram page and see where we're playing. Uh, the momentum is really going great. Um, the band is on fire right now, and we got some great shows coming up. So make sure you check that out, and we appreciate it. And once again, Thank you for tuning in to Soundcheck and make sure you subscribe. Thanks. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Hey, hey. Here we are at Soundcheck. We're back. Ryden Hour, Robinette, Sedawi, and Dave the Beast Spitz. Yo. Spitz. Yo. Really excited to have him. Um, we're glad that you came back. Uh, make sure that if you love this podcast, or even if you think it sucks, hit on the subscribe <laughs> button because... That's what we do. We Hit need the subscribe you. Button. Thank you so much. Dave, once yeah. again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm really excited. This the first segment. Phew, what a ride we're having so far. Yeah. So take us back. Um, when we left off, you were basically I'm um, coming towards the end of college. You were in Freeway. Right. And tell us what happened to uh, the demise of Freeway or how it ended up. Uh, okay, so I was just getting really frustrated. Uh, like I said, we wrote a couple songs. We were just playing clubs, and this was just not enough for me. I had to move on. I had to get into the next you know, the next level. I had to mm -hmm. keep going. I believed in myself. You got to believe in yourself. Otherwise, no one's Absolutely. ever going to believe in you. That's what the life is all about. No matter Remember what that. you do, no matter what you do, you got to believe in yourself and you got to put yourself out there and you got to be motivated. You got to wake up every day and say, what can I do to keep moving forward in my life and get where I want to go? So that's where I was at at this time. Um, we, we were playing a lot. So anyway, I get a call and my brother was still back, you know, down in New York in Rockland County. And he was getting plugged in. He was starting to play guitar. And he met some other guys. And he met these. We was out at a club one night watching the band Zebra, which yeah. was very popular from Rockland County in New yeah. York, where we were from. He was out, and he ended up meeting this guy, Gerard DeMarini from Brooklyn, and Walt Wildman Woodward III was a drummer. <laughs> and they were in a band called Americade. Anyway, and I'll try to keep it short because we've we got a lot of bands to cover here. Anyway, he met them, and they were hanging, and they were getting rid of their bass player. They were coming out of Brooklyn. These two brothers had a lot of money, God bless them, and they had all kinds of equipment, and they were original band, and they were looking to make it. They wanted to get a record deal, and that's what I was looking to do. So my brother ended up meeting them, and they were like, look, you know, we're kicking out the bass player. We need a bass player. My brother's like, you got to meet my brother. He's upstate New York. He's the best bass player in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they called me up, and I, I was way up in Rochester with Freeway, and I'm like, Danny's like, you got to come down, and these guys want to audition you. I'm like, I'm on the next flight, bro. I flew down to Brooklyn. They came and picked me up. I didn't even know any of the songs. They didn't send me a tape. In this instance, usually they give you a tape. You learn the song. I didn't have tape. a clue. A tape. A tape. tape. A cassette. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did not even have a cassette. 
I had I knew nothing about them. You couldn't look them up. We didn't have any phones. Right, 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 internet. right. No internet. My brother just said, "Look, these guys got a couple of bucks. They, they got some stuff happening. People are you know interested. Come on down." So I flew down. Took me, drove me to Brooklyn. I went down. I jammed with these guys. They loved me. We went down. He just started riffing around, and it was two brothers. Gerard was a guitar player, and PJ was his brother, was a singer. And this great drummer, Walt Woodward III, rest in peace, he died about 12 years ago. He was from a band called Rachel, which some of the people that go way back in New York, do you remember a band called Riot? Yeah. Rhett Forrester was a singer. He died in a gun battle a long time ago. But he was a singer. Rachel was a hot band. He was an amazing front man and singer. Walter, the drummer, used to be in the band with this guy. And he left to join these brothers. Uh. So I went down there with Jam. Boom, they love me. I'm like, okay, I got to go back up and pack up all my stuff in upstate New York. And then I'm coming back. And their, their parents had money. Okay, so they own this. This is in Brooklyn. And they own this building that they let me. When I moved down, I moved all the way from Rochester. I'm like, goodbye, freeway. I'm out of here. I left like three different girlfriends. See you later. I'm gone. You know. We were selling weed to stay alive. Back then, we had like pounds of weed in the fucking refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You told me you wanted to get a <laughs> yeah, little yeah, dirty. Yeah, that's great okay? stuff. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, that's good. We, we had to have some weed to smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't really drink much then. We used to smoke a lot of weed. I don't do it anymore. Yeah. Now I just drink a little bit of scotch. Okay, I but like it. Back then, anyway. So I moved. I'm like, goodbye. See you later. I'm gone. I moved to Brooklyn. The, 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 the brother's family owned this building in Queens, which was right next to where they were. In, they lived in Bay Ridge. Oh, I remember, Ooh, yeah. fancy schmancy. They lived on the water <laughs> with a boat <laughs> in a mansion. <laughs> I'm like, this is great. And they're going to pay us like $65 a week just to play. Cool. You guys are going to live here. We own the building. It's all rented. But the basement, you guys can have. So they gave me and Walter, the drummer, the basement. We called it the Rock Dungeon. <laughs> Me and Walter lived in the Rock Dungeon, and it was dark. There was like two light bulbs in the whole place. Let me tell you, we had so many chicks coming in and out of there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to get too far into All right, that. good, good. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I had my uh, my parents gave me a car. I had the old Chrysler Cordoba. Remember, rich oh, yeah. Corinthian leather. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. <laughs> Ricardo Montalban. Yeah, the rich they gave Corinthian me leather. rich Corinthian leather. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a car. So we used to drive like 15 minutes from the Rock Dungeon to their fancy place, and we rehearsed there. I'm telling you, this band, we had as much equipment as Van Halen. I am not kidding. We had so much equipment. I did base cabinets that were like custom made by a company called What You Want out of Long Island, right? And you got me into this, so you got to listen now. I got good. <laughs> the guitar player had like 18 four by 12s that he painted. He wanted to be, him and I thought alike. Like I said, you got to be, create your own style and be unique. This guitar player, Gerard, had the same thing. He was younger. He was like a young guy, but a talented guy. And he used to write all these songs. He wanted to be like the next Van Halen. So it was like kind of like modeled after Van Halen kind of, but heavy also. It was like Sabbath heavy, but like Van Halen. And, and it was really cool. He wrote all these songs. No one knew who he were, and he wanted to be different. So he had all these custom bass and guitar cabinets built, and then he painted. He wasn't even happy. He painted them silver with silver spray paint. So nobody had anything. Right. We, we used to rehearse in the, in, the, in the back of their house there, and we had all we had all originals. Anyway, we ended up going to record and produce our first album called American Metal. This is in 1982. Okay. What was the name of the band again? Americade. 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 So one word. Yeah. So someone went online. They'd see something on there. Americade. Something. You're not just going to see it online. You're going to see the videos that we did. We were one of the first videos ever. On MTV, we yeah. did a remake of We're an American Band. I remember oh, something I, okay. vaguely. That, I know it's that pretty name. cheesy. I, when, I remember that. When you name. watch it now, it's pretty cheesy. But back then, sure, it was, it was a concept video where we we acted out the whole story with American Band with the chicks and the, we're in the limo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not, this, <laughs> this was no fooling around. Uh, These guys. No fooling around serious stuff. We <laughs> rented out the Philadelphia Spectrum Arena to shoot the live portion of the show. 
And the parents paid for the... the they paid for everything. I'm wow. telling you. Wow. So Ameri- Americon, did they do one record? Maricade. Maricade. No, did Maricade, Maricade did one record. This is the first, this, no, two. This All is the right. first record, and this is where we're getting to, to the next main yeah, yeah, part yeah. of my history there. So Maricade was good, and i got to mention this. These guys did not want to pay the... I already paid a lot of dues. I thought I did, you know, playing all the time, four nights a week. But these guys tried to skip playing all the dues. So what we did, because they had the money, God bless them. We took out a, we didn't play clubs. We did not play clubs. All the other bands, Twisted Sister, which came from Long Island, yeah. you know, and these other bands, White Tiger. Zebra, yeah. Zebra. Rat Race Choir. Rat Race that? Choir. Yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. These guys wanted to try to skip that because they had money. And I thought, okay, I'm going along for the ride. Yeah. I got nothing to lose here. I'm just getting more known and I'm getting experience. So we did not play clubs. We rented theaters mm. and we sent handwritten invitations to all the record people with limos to come watch us play. We had confetti cannons. We had so much gear and we gave all the tickets for free to all our fans. Right. And we just packed the place just to bring down the record people in limbos. I'm not making this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm digging it, go. To try to get a record deal, okay? So we kept doing that. Then we took out a two-page Village Voice. Yeah. Village Voice was the biggest. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay? absolutely. We took out the middle double page in the Village Voice with the picture of the band with the four of us. We had custom-made clothes. We had, you know, spandex. Everyone did spandex. <laughs> All custom-made. We didn't even put the name of the band. We just put our picture there, and then whatever the, the next showcase was, pe- the, all the other bands hated us. They hated us. Who are these guys? Right, right, right. right. Okay, so th- like I said, the idea was a smart idea, but eventually it didn't work. So anyway, we brought all these people down. We had a bunch of interest. People were interested. They w- we did this first album. We produced ourselves, American Metal, okay? And then when we did the video for We're an American Band, they hired this world famous artist, I can't remember his name. We did like a 50 foot rendition of the album cover, which was just American, American metal. If you go on YouTube, it's on there. Yeah, yeah. It I'm was going unbelievable to, yeah. Oh, yeah. what we did in this video. People are like, who are these guys? You know, what kind of nerve do they have? So that didn't happen. We didn't get a deal. So then their next step was let's hire a world famous record producer. So we hired Jeff Glixman. I know produced- Jeff personally. You do? I do. I went, uh, he's, uh, Phil Ehart managed an artist that I was on tour with, and that's how I met Jeff, from Kansas. Exactly correct. I didn't know who you met, yep. but the next point I was going to make is Glixman produced Kansas, Left Overture, yep. Carry On My Way With Son, Dust In The Wind. He produced like two or three Kansas albums, Saxon, Gary Moore, Cards yep. of Power, Victims of the Future, George, uh, Paul Stanley's solo album. This guy was one of the hottest world famous record producers in the in the 70s and early yep. 80s so americade these guys were smart they were like we are going to get a deal if we're going to pay for it we're going to get a deal they hired glicksman to record our second album with americade so we hired him they paid him a bunch of money gave him a percentage whatever we went down to atlanta access studios it's this famous studio that was built to record gospel choirs had like a 50 foot ceiling we set up walter's drums in there with like two overhead mics and it was like bottom man was i was just gonna bomb. say it's got to be Zeppelin. it was like light. god and we i went and record so anyway i go we, we go down to atlanta to stay there to record for like a month so they hired jeff glicksman me and him hit it off like that he recognized my talent within the first two days we got to be buddies he realized and i hate to say this he realized that the singer was just not quite the right guy. Right. And we had a bunch of really good new songs. They were really good. They were heavier, too. Anyway, he had brought me in the back into his office, Glitzman, the producer. And I shouldn't really be telling this story. But I usually don't tell this, but I'm going to tell it today. That's good. We like that. For you guys. For you guys. We like that. Cool. Okay. Because Gerard, he'll probably end up seeing this. You know, because I'm, I'm still friends with him. Anyway, God bless him. But he, he, I'm sure he understands. Anyway, so Glitzman had brought me into his office, and he says, Beast, this band is great. You got a good look. Everybody, uh, remember, our hair, our hair was like up to here. Yeah. You know, it's not like these days where it's just all one length. 
you know, your hair was like a, this before white line. You had to get yeah, final. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This you was final net. We were yeah. <laughs> spray right. it up. Aquanet. Aquanet. That's we, what we were it was. one of the earliest hair bands. It's even before Motley Crue <laughs> and all these, you know, other L.A. schmoes. Anyway, he, he, Glixman brings me in the office and he opens up his drawer and he pulls out a piece of paper. He goes, "Beast, these are all the greatest singers in the world." He picks up the phone. He goes, "Who do I start dialing?" I'm like, "You can't. You can't." The guy says. PJ is 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 his He's brother. He's the guy. It's his band. He's the yeah. That's where the money's coming from. He's his brother. I, it's not, you know, he was really into it because he loved the songs. But you know, he he just felt that something was a little a little missing. So anyway, we record the album. It's called Rock Hard. So at the end of the record, Glixman takes me aside and he says, "Beast, you're amazing. I've never seen anybody play bass like you. You're just on your way up." He goes, one day you're going to get a phone call from me. You're going to get a phone call from me someday. I'm like, great. Shook his hand. We left. We left. We did shows. Nothing ever happened. He calls. Me and the, the drummer left. We had another band, New York, New York, whatever. Nothing doesn't even make, worth mentioning. Americade comes to an ending. Right. Producer tells you you're going to get a phone call one day. Right. Okay. You're still in New York I'm at in this New York. point. Yeah. Right now, because you moved back. You're back in Queens, right? More or less. Right. Actually, after I left America, I moved back in with, with my parents. You, fin you, fin you finished college? Yeah. Yeah, okay. that was over so let's move. let's move forward. You get the gig. What about the first phone call you got for White Lion? Let's get right into okay, that. Okay, so White Lion, uh, me and the drummer from, from America. White Lion? Well, yeah. well Mike Tramp is from, is from, uh, from Denmark. Vito Brada is from Staten Island. Okay, so Vito's right. from Staten Island. They're so from Staten Island. So they met because that's a whole other story. Okay. I don't want to waste time on that. Okay. It doesn't matter. People can look that shit so up. So did you play live with them or did you actually record with them? With who? White Lion. Well, both, both. Okay. But what happened is me and the drummer left America. We had a couple of bands. That wasn't happening. It was short-lived, whatever. I was like, all right, I'm thinking about going back to do some graduate work, eventually going to law school. So I get a call from my friend Phil Ernst, who was a college friend, who turned out to be a really one of the biggest booking agents in New York City. And he was booking White Lion. They were already happening. They they had a they had their hit. They had a record. No, no, no. It's before that. Oh, okay. Before yeah. the first album came out. Oh, before okay, Fight it. to Survive yeah. came out. They had they had the four uh, four managers, two big agents, two guys that own. You know about Lamours? I know Lamours. Okay, yeah. Lamours is the biggest heavy metal club yeah. in the history of the United States, where everybody started from yeah, in yeah. Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay, two brothers, George and Michael Parente. So, the, they had. Those two brothers and two biggest agents in New York City. Anyway, so Phil Ernst, the agent, calls me up. We went to college together. He goes, Beast, I'm booking this band, White Lion. They had the guy Felix Robinson from Angel, who's, who played with them originally. They kicked him out. He played a couple of shows. He sucked. They kicked him out. They were auditioning everybody in the fucking world. I want you to go down. So, okay, he sets it up. In this case, I go down to 52nd Street next to the, the original Hard Rock. Yeah. I go in this little tiny office where the managers were, and they play me a cassette of four songs of White Line. And I'm just sitting there just trying to contain myself. I'm like, this fucking, these fucking songs are fucking great. It was heavy. It was now remember, this is early White Line. A yeah. lot of people don't understand because they got really light after I left. But this is the early days when it was heavier. They played me four songs, Broken Heart, In the City, Valhalla, something else. Oh, you remember the names. Oh, yeah, great. I'm sitting there going, and I'm just trying to contain myself because I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, you know, like before right, you go on, right, yeah, 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 yeah. like this. This fucking, these songs are badass. These guys are fucking good. This guy's a badass guitar player. The fucking singer looks like fucking better than David Lee Roth. Yeah, yeah. Right. He's got fucking, you know, I'm like, give me the tape. I go home. They set up the audition. I go home. I learn the fucking songs. I drive all the way down to fucking Lemoore's, and they're trying out like 80 guys, right? <laughs> is the band trying them the out? The band, the band. With is, the singer? Because sometimes the I was whole band. It, uh, was, it was Mike Tramp, Vito Brada, and the original drummer, Nicky Capozzi, yeah. which most people don't know because he was gone. He was like a Neil Peart fucking guy. That was fucking amazing. Got big fucking, you know, curly, crazy hair out to here. So I go down there, learn the fucking songs, and Vito was like, I don't want to get too deep. He was trying to fuck me up the whole time. You cannot fuck up I gotta, I gotta the beast. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, only did I know the songs, I know every fucking lick you ever could play, motherfucker. Right, yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So <laughs> we're in the fucking, he's trying to fuck me up in the songs and I'm turning it around and fucking turning into so you got you got the game. Cream. I got, got the game. There's like the eight guys waiting. It was down in the basement, in the cement fucking basement of Lemoore's. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so you, Mike so Tramp goes running up the stairs. It's like six guys up there. He goes, go home. We got the guy. Go home. He threw it. Oh, I've been there and so done I that. Got the yeah. gig. Uh, I got the gig. So you got the gig. So move, the gig. Move, moving forward. Wow. You yes. got the gig. White line. You did some shows with them. A lot of shows. A lot of shows with them. How, what, what year was this around? This is uh, 84. 84. This is before their breakout, right? Before. Before, before wait. Before. before. Okay. Right. So you ended up with them. You, you did recording with them as well. We did a bunch of recording. What happened with White Lion was they actually, this is an interesting story and it's worth taking yeah. a minute or two. Yeah. Okay. White Lion had a, a, a giant deal with Electro Asylum, but they were signed before Motley Crue, before Metallica, before all these LA, LA bands. We were New York, fucking New York City band, man. Right. You know, LA is one thing. New York City is like, do not fucking, it was a, Back then, it was a distinction. Right. Okay. But what happened was, because we had these four big managers, they got to the top. So White Lion was signed by Bob Krasnow, which is a fucking cigar-chomping president of Electra. No one else at the label knew who the fuck we were. And they got signed before I joined. Vito already had like 12 marshals. <laughs> I brought in like, oh I bought God, all these fucking 12 fucking base cabinets, <laughs> which I paid for myself. <laughs> they had like $300,000 upfront money. That's what used to happen back in the 80s, folks. Yes. They would give you money. They would sign you for a two, three, you know, option, you know, album deal. Yep. That doesn't exist anymore. No. So they had gotten signed by Krasnow, the president of the label. And then there was one guy that was on the A&R staff, Artists and Relations, who ended up getting fired. No one knew who we were. So they kept, this is a crazy, most people don't know this story. And I joined right after they got signed. They kicked the other guy out. We were out, we were fucking playing because we had these big agents. We were opening for Twisted Sister, Crocus, Blue Oyster Cult, fucking Zebra. We were blowing these fucking guy, God bless you guys. We were blowing everyone off the stage. White Lion, and believe me, original White Lion was heavy. It's not way, way, yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, Children Cry. God bless them. They had a bunch of top 10 hits. Children Cry, that was the After other After I one. left, God bless them, whatever. I'm just saying, I'm backing up. This was heavy. White yeah, yeah. Lion was fucking heavy. Vito yeah. was playing. He was bending fucking strings and shit. Anyway, yeah. they put us on the road with all these guys. They kept kicking us off the shows because we fucking were blowing them away. Yeah, yeah. Here's a funny story. Crocus, we, we ended up... They got us a gig to open for Crocus, and they were filming it for an MTV live concert at, at the Hartford Civic Center in Connecticut. Mm. Arena, okay? So we got, and we used to fucking do the fucking, you know, kiss you, you know. We had the whole show down. We were fucking, even as a warm-up act. So I remember that. The, the singer from Crocus was sitting on the side of the stage. He was fucking biting his fucking fingernails off. We were so good... I'm telling you the truth. No, it's great. I'm, they were I'm, filming it for MTV. We were fucking so good. We blew them away so much. They had to refilm them, Crocus, at another show. So then they kicked us off. Anyway, so anyway, we're playing. We're doing all these things. But we didn't. What happened is Electra dropped the band. No one knew who we were. They kept postponing the release of the album, Fight to Survive. If that album, I could never prove it. If Fight to Survive would have come out when it was supposed to, I, in my heart, feel that it would have been way huger than, than White Lion ever got. I probably never would have been in Sabbath. It would have been a whole different timeline right. for my life and probably for theirs, too. But it didn't happen that way. They kept postponing the release of the album. Then they dropped the band. They're like, we're not giving you the fucking masters. You got to pay us back for all the hundreds of thousands we gave you. So yeah. here we are in this behind the eight ball and we're out there and everyone is, we got a buzz going. We're blowing people away. They're getting us gigs. We're playing all over the place, getting thrown off tours. So then we had, our managers had to try to find us another deal to pay back Electra to get the tapes to release the fucking album. Right. Was the album ready to release ever? No. Well, well, eventually. So this is what happened. So eventually they got some money. They got some interest from uh, JVC Victor in Japan. So they put up some money 
they, they worked out some deal with Electra. They were going to release it as an import. They gave us some money to do a video of the song Broken Heart, which was the big, you know, we thought was going to be the hit song. And they ended up redoing it later. So White Lion fans will know Broken Heart. Things are starting to happen. We set up this thing to shoot the video, like a three-day shoot at a theater in New Jersey for Broken Heart. JVC, the Japan company, puts up the money. So we go to the theater. We're playing. After the first day of the shooting, I get a fucking phone call. Okay, wait, wait. We didn't, we didn't get the first part of it yet. Oh, I got to back up. I got to back up. So while I was in White Lion, let me back up a little. While I was in White Lion, all the shit was happening. We're trying to get things going. We didn't have the deal yet, the, the Japan money. I get a call from Glitzman. The producer says, one day I'm going to call you. He goes, Beast, I'm working with Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath. I told him all about you. I want to fly you out here. He wants to check you out for Black Sabbath. I'm like, dude, send me a ticket. Boom, I'm on a fucking plane. I fly to fucking L.A. This is like uh, mid-80s. This is 85. 86, 85, yeah. 85. So I fly out because we're back on track from White Light, right? They bring me out. They bring me to this fucking really dark studio with black lights and red lights to meet Iommi. I'm like, how you doing? This is in L.A. This is in L.A. A at a studio, rehearsal studio. Some rehearsal studio. Is it late. just Tony? No, Tony and Eric Singer. Right, right, Eric Because Eric was playing on... Eric from Kiss. Right, no, that's a much oh, later. From Badlands. I, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Eric was And that's how you met Ian Lena Gillen, Ford. by the way. I mean, not, not Ray Gillen. This is I how you met Ray Gillen. I discovered Ray Gillen. Okay, but I'm that's saying... That's story. But, but I'm saying, this you play with Eric. Be, way before Ray Gillen. All right. Way before. Way before. This is, uh, this is Iommi doing demos for his solo album. That was, was what it was supposed to be. So Eric Singer was already at Alita Ford, and because uh, Randy Castile left Alita Ford to join Ozzy, whatever. Right. We're all connected. All right. So they, they bring me into the studio late at night. It's me, Tony Iommi, Eric Singer, and Jeff Nichols, the keyboard player. Okay. How you doing, Tony? You know, and look, I grew up with Sabbath. Of course, I right, guess right. I guess I was a little nervous, but not really. Right, because you knew I was the like, tunes, right? I knew every fucking note Beezer <laughs> ever played, and Jack Bruce, and fucking Ed Whistle, you and Stanley gotcha. Clark, and Chris Squire. I was already almost the full beast. So is, now let me ask you this: I gotta yeah. stop you for a second. When you go out there. Are you, is this an audition for a band or are you going to sit in on a session or is there a band being created and yet they're looking for a bass player? It's just an audition that was set up by Glixman, the producer, that for? was working, that was recording with Iommi for what was supposed to be his solo album. Okay, it was supposed to be a solo album. This wasn't... It wasn't originally Back Sabbath. It was going to be Iommi's solo album originally. Got it, got That's it. That's how it was played. So you went in there, you that played changes. for him, he heard you. So we went in, we start jamming. I'm bending the fucking fuck out of every note yeah. i'm fucking looking at him he's looking at me and this guy's and T iomi's like a really mellow you know yeah. soft-spoken cat okay you know and he's looking at me like who is this fucking guy i've never fucking seen anybody play like this guy except for fucking geezer. geezer yeah yeah and i'm just fucking wailing i'm fucking i got my fucking red specter i'm and we just hit it off for the fucking first second <laughs> I got hired immediately. So I call up fucking, they're like, Beast, you're in, you're staying here for the next six weeks, you're recording. So I had to call up White Lion, and they're back in New York waiting for me, because I told them I was going for this audition. Right. So they canceled gigs, they're waiting for me, I'm out there, I record the whole album, it turns into, you know, it was supposed to be all the greatest singers in the world, Dio, Halford, Ozzy, it turned into Glenn Hughes becoming the singer and calling it Black Sabbath featuring Tony Iommi. Most people know the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the I, label I, I wanted it to here. be Sabbath. So I'm out there, and Tony Elmi is engaged to Lita Ford at the time. She's in the studio the whole time. So she's watching me and Eric Singer as the rhythm section play. So when we finish the tracks, the basic tracks, she hires us to do her album. So I call up White Lion, hey, I'm going to be here another month. They're fucking hating me because they're sitting right. at home twiddling their thumbs. So anyway... Lita Ford story, I go out there, she fired like three producers, she showed up like twice, she was all fucked up. We left. Me and Eric left, I went home. So I'm back with White Lion, jump ahead to where we were before. So I'm back, we're playing, we're at the video, we're, we're filming the video in Jersey at the theater. The first day, after the first day, I get a call from Tony Aomi and Don Arden. You know Don Arden? Yeah, 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 yeah. well yeah. I know the name. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Don Arden is Sharon Arden's father. 
who managed Sabbath. Yes, also Ozzy. Also owned Ozzy, yeah. Jet Records, Elvis. I don't want to get too fucking. So you got the call, and now what happens? You go, like, Beast, we want yeah. you to join Black Sabbath. Okay, so you got to go back out there. We're calling it Black Sabbath featuring Tony Aomi. You're in the band. So now I'm actually in the middle of filming the video, the video with, with White, White Lion. Lion. I got to go in at the end of the video. And tell him. And tell him. See ya. And it was very tough this decision. Is great. This is a good shot. Yeah, yeah, very good tough decision for me because these are my brothers. Yeah. Even Fuck though, all that. But <laughs> you know what? It's an opportunity of a lifetime. To, Interesting. All right. Very tough decision because these are my brothers. I, I really believe in White Lion. The band was amazing. I really felt in my bones that this band, even though we got dropped, we're getting another deal. We got all the fucking elements. We got the fucking killer singer. Looks better than any singer on the fucking planet. And he's, look, Mike Tramp was in a listen, band. Listen, listen, I want to tell you this. Let me tell you. I want to see <laughs> the expression on your face when you turn the TV on and you saw them with their first hit. What like? Because I remember ex something that happened to me, something not similar to I'll that. I'll tell you a story about that. But I mean, you get the gig. Right, so okay. I left. But I, but, I, but I have to ask you, you get the gig, you start rehearsals. There's a vision. With you Sabbath, have a band. Mean. Right, with Sabbath. Yeah. Is Eric in that band? Is Eric in that lineup? Oh, absolutely. Oh, so Eric's in uh, the lineup. Eric and I became like... But Glenn Hughes. Glenn Hughes yourself. was... Well, Glenn Hughes became the singer. When we right. recorded the basic tracks... Even after they hired me, they flew me out. I recorded. I left. I came back. We finished the tracks. We did not know who was singing in the. Oh, so there record. was no scratch vocal or anything. No scratch vocal. They did not know because originally it was Naomi solo album. It was going to be all the right. the famous metal singers in the yeah, world. I got you. I got you. That didn't pan out. Right. They changed it later to become Glenn Hughes because. Tony and Glenn have been friends for many years. They're all English right, guys. Right, right. So Glenn ended up becoming the singer, recording the vocals at a completely different studio outside of L.A. in Atlanta or, or somewhere else on the East Coast. And that became Seven Star. Right. Ah, that okay. became the Seven Star did you record. Tour, did you tour on that record? Of course. What, a year? Oh, for quite a while. Up to a couple of years well, you toured well, on that. That's a whole other story. I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get right. To, I'm trying to get right to it. Okay. So what so happened is Glenn Hughes, who is I call I call him the Frank Sinatra of rock and roll, because Frank Sinatra is one of the greatest singers of, of our generation yeah. of our time. Okay. No one fucking sings like Glenn Hughes and writes songs. He's unbelievable. He's still crushing it. Yeah. Crushing it. Just crushing played, it. Commun he just did black black, black country community. Yeah. Black country community. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I saw him just a few months ago. Okay. So. He became the singer on that record. But Glenn Hughes used to be, and he understands this if he sees this interview, he was a skinny, sexy fucking guy with the white outfits. He played bass, you know, yeah. pretty pretty solid bass, yeah. and sang like God. Him and Coverdale used to switch off. Yeah, yeah, Burn, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Anyone who knows Glenn Hughes in Deep Purple, he never fronted a band, and at this time in his life, it was just a bad time. He was way overweight. He had all kinds of other, other trouble, drug trouble, women trouble, all this other shit. And it was just a weird, unfortunately for me and Eric Singer at the time, it was a bad time for his life. So we did a whole pre-production. People know the story. I'm not going to go too deep. Get, get right to the Ray Gillen. I'm, I'm excited okay. about the Ray Gillen because so, I love that guy. Well, okay, let me tell you that story. Yeah. So Glenn only lasted like five shows on the tour. We're out. The album's out. We do a video for No Stranger to Love, which is a ballad, which I always thought was great song, mistake. After fucking Ozzy left and they did Born Again with Ian Gillen, which was a fucking flop. Several years later, Giza left. Then I, then all us young whippersnappers joined. We got this great, and we knew the fucking shit just as good as anybody else. The band was fucking amazing. Nothing against Bill Ward and Giza. Those guys are the original guys. They're, they're fucking legends, yeah. okay? But they had nothing on us. We were fucking playing that shit perfect with a lot of heart and feeling. Me and Eric Singer, we were fucking kicking ass. But what happened was Glenn Hughes was just, it, was the, it wasn't the right thing for him. He All never right. just fronted a band. He was way overweight. He had the, the fucking lighting designer got in a fight with him, punched him in the fucking face. He got fucking, his throat was all fucked up. Jesus this is in all Christ. the Sabbath books. I'm not, this is... True. 
It's in all the no, seven books. this is books. great inside no, 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 shit. I got you, I got you. Yeah. So we're out. This is the biggest break of my life. I'm on the road with Black Sabbath. My parents are there. My brother. It's Anthrax, Wasp, and Sabbath at fucking, oh my at fucking God. Meadowlands and Nassau Coliseum in New York, where I'm from. Oh, yeah. My whole family's oh, there. Oh, And Glenn God. Hughes is out there, and he's out there. And he oh, can't no. fucking sing. Oh, no. The keyboard player is singing his parts. So Iomi, and I, I, I'm like, I can't believe this. So Iomi comes up to me with Don Arden after like the third show. He goes, we all knew what was happening. We felt bad. It was tough. But the guy, yeah. did, it was yeah. just a bad time in his life. It, was, yeah. it wasn't working out. Meanwhile, we're on the road. It's the first new album with Sabbath in like five, six years. The album is doing great. The songs fucking and the video are doing great. People are interested. It's getting a buzz. And this guy can't fucking sing. We're, we're getting at the fucking arenas. So Iomi and, and, and Don Arden pull me backstage one night and go, Beast, do you know any other know singers? Any singers? I knew it was coming. It was coming for sure. <laughs> Dude, Ray Gillen was just like, oh my and I am just, God. I'm just a hired gun. So I'm like, yeah. Where did you hear, where, where did you hear from I'm Ray? I'm going to tell you. No, said, you got to tell me. I, got the, I have the right guy. You can believe me or well, not. What band was he in? Ray, I knew from when I was in White Lion. He was in he was in a band with Rondinelli. With Rondinelli, who's Rondinelli, still going. Whose whole family and his brother and his sister. What was sister, the name of the band? It was just called Rondinelli, I think. It was a, him, his brother, his sister played keyboards. I saw them play one time at Lemoore's. Remember, we used to rehearse in the basement. So you Lemoore's. got a hold of him. Tell me you called him. I fucking saw this guy Ray sing. I'm like, he's handsome. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? I didn't know any of the songs. The band wasn't that good. I'm like, who is this guy? And I saw him one at a time. I, we were having a party. It was one of our birthdays in White Lion. We were at the Hard Rock, the first Hard Rock that ever existed in New York. And Ray was sitting at another table. I was at White Lion. We were having a birthday. I'm like, Ray, how you doing? So I got his number. So when they give me the call, they're like, Beast, you know any singers? I'm like, I got the right guy. So we found Ray. We called him up. And they wanted Ray to send an audition tape. He goes, I don't have any tapes. He was lying. He didn't want to send any tapes. He wanted to sing for Iomi in person. Right. So behind Glenn knows this. Without Glenn Hughes knowing about it, we brought Ray on the tour bus. And we told Glenn, and he knows this, we told Glenn that Ray was just a good friend of mine. He was hanging out with us. And on the bus, he was singing with Iomi in the back of the bus. And we, we tried him out. Secretly, he wasn't really secretly. He had to be a child because when I met he was him, young. he was young. He might have been in his mid 20s. So, yeah, he, we, we were all in like late 20s or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. And he was totally unknown. He just, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He was Badlands didn't even come out yet. Badlands, that's a whole. I started that band. Okay, but years ago. That's a whole of other fucking story, bro. Okay, okay. So, you let's, get get into right, that? let's get into let's, 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 let's do this. I started that fucking let's band. Let's do this. I gotcha. <laughs> so, so Ray's on the bus. Okay, and this is, this is the great story. You, you're, the viewers will love this. So we got Ray on the bus. He's just a friend of mine. We're actually, he's singing on the bus with Iomi in the back lounge. So we bring him secretly. We say, Glenn, you know, we had a guy, Doug Goldstein. We called him Iron Man. We had him babysitting, watching fucking Glenn. So he wouldn't, he was like snorting up the fucking world. Okay? And he knows that. Okay? And, he, and eating, we, one, one night at the studio, we ordered like like 10 Indian dinners. He like he <laughs> ate like every one of them. When we turned around, we were recording. So it was a bad time in Glenn's life. And he will attest to that. Although he's amazing and skinny now, you know, it was just a bad time. Yeah, I got you, I got you. Okay, so anyway. So we're, we're, Ray auditions we're, in the back okay. of the bus. So Ray, we're in the bus. So then we bring him out and we're, we're trying Ray out at the fucking sound checks when Glenn's not around. And all the crew knows, and I always like, no one fucking Tell says me Ray nothing. Killed it. Killed it. He was doing great. Knowing his songs. I'm writing out all the fucking lyrics for him and shit. Spreading out, you know, on, on papers. Anyway. So oh my God. So we got we, we so we got we're in Worcester, Massachusetts. Where I, where I lived. Okay. I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. I didn't know that. Didn't yeah, know yeah, that. yeah. I lived there for okay, seven we're years. In Worcester. in Worcester. We're in Worcester. Yeah. And we're at the fucking hotel. Mm -hmm. And and we're at a fucking we're partying before or after the show. I can't remember. We're in some fucking little hotel room. It is packed. I'm in one corner. Eric's in another corner. Ray's in another corner. And Glenn's in another corner. And all these fucking sexy bitches are there. We're partying. We're drinking. Uh -huh. We're partying. And I'm just like thinking, 
This, this, this is going to go bad. This is going to go <laughs> bad, brother. <laughs> At any minute. Oh, my the God. The one singer's the in the one corner. And, <laughs> so sure enough, I'm paying attention. Despite the parting, I'm like, I hear some chick go, look, that's the new singer of Black oh! Sabbath. Oh, no, no, no. no. To me, I do a beeline out. I get in my room. I lock the door. I call up Bernie, the tour manager. I'm like, Bernie. The shit has hit, hit the, the van. van. <laughs> he goes, Beast, bolt your door. Put, <laughs> put the fucking the fucking furniture <laughs> against the door. Sure enough, it's like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Boosh, boosh. The door is bending. No. It's Glenn Hughes. I don't open the door. And the next morning, he was gone. And they told him, and then that was it. Okay, so, so now we canceled Ray the, get the gig. We canceled a couple shows. We rented a theater in Worcester, and we pushed him out on stage at New Haven. And that was Ray was in the band. Okay, Ray was in the band. How, wow, how long did that last? Oh, well, then we, we, we tried to finish the tour as much as we could, but because Glenn Hughes was on the album, he was in the video. Legal you know, hassles everywhere. No, it wasn't legal. It was just that you know the t- ticket sales fell off because the whole thing got fucked up. Okay, so so uh, we, we ended up regrouping. We went we went home, then we went back to Europe, to England, and started working on the next album, Eternal Lionel. Okay, so let me ask you this uh, because a lot of people ha- had tons of questions to ask you, and obviously we didn't get to them today. Yeah, but um, we do another. So one. yeah, right, we, we only we, we get part of this stuff. Yeah, too. maybe we maybe we could do another one. By the way, I want to yeah, we have to do a second part. Yeah, because we only got to like you know half of. I, where I, I'm I love at. that. Well, let me ask you this. Um, and I, I got to skip I gotta, because a lot of people were asking me about this. Yeah. So one, once that, you, you ended up uh, finishing, let's just get to the end of that. We'll finish that. Right. Okay, whatever that era was, you ended up moving to L.A., correct? Right, correct. How long did you live out there, by the way? I lived there for eight years, 88 through 96. Were you there by yourself? Yeah, I moved there myself. Actually, moved there with another band with, uh, called Leo. We're not going to get into that right but, now. But, 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 you, that but turned you, were into, play, you were playing out there. Of course. Also. I moved there for music. So Leo turned into me meeting Chris and Pelletieri with Graham Bonnet singing. With Graham Bonnet. World Badass. legendary singer. Graham Bad, Bonnet, definitely. one of the greatest singers. Nice guy or no? Lovely you, guy. Lovely guy. Nice bad, guy. Oh, another bad time in his life, uh, alcoholic-wise. He's, he's uh, you know, totally since straightened out. But uh, we got along famously. We used to send Graham home to fucking work on lyrics. And he would come back and it was like the fucking Beatles. This guy was an unbelievable songwriter and singer. I've never, it was like him and Glenn Hughes. Was he? Yeah. Or one of the questions you had, you said earlier, mm. was what was his favorite singer to work with? Yeah. Um, My favorite singer to work with? Not a- Andy Mendez? Well, Andy, I'm, I'm singing I, with now. I love Andy. This is possible. I, look, it's <laughs> hard. Grand, Grant, Grant Bonnet. I've worked with some of the greatest, you yes. know, legendary singers. Who you have the most singers. fun with? I don't know. It's hard to say, really. You know, I mean, Dio and I, Ronnie James Dio, was not in Sabbath at the time mm-hmm. that I was in Sabbath, but we we were we ended up being very very close friends. God rest his soul. I had a band in L.A. which we didn't even touch on called Insomnia. We used to rehearse right next to Ronnie, him and Vinny, and I helped him and Vinny try out guitar players. Me and Ronnie used to. Vinny, smoke. another Long Island guy. Vinny, Vinny, uh, and, and his brother, and Carmine, and I have done. Yeah. Teaching clinics all over the world, you know, okay. back in the day. So you so, stayed in LA. So me and me and oh. the point was me and me and Dio were were even though we didn't play together at the same time. We're still good Sabbath, friends. We were very good friends. Actually, when he when Ronnie wrote his phone number for me, he wrote Ronnie the Beast Dio, which I still have put away somewhere. Mm. So no Ronnie, kidding. We weren't in the band together at the same time, but to me, Dio is the greatest metal singer of all time. Mm. Okay, so now you're in LA, right? You finished out there. You were given lessons. You were teaching. Maybe you were still playing with other bands. Right. What got What got you here uh, in Florida? Well, I was what, doing what was karate that? for a long time. We didn't even touch on that. Maybe we yep. can hit next on that time. next time. Yeah. You know, I've been I've been training traditional Goju karate for over fifty years. I'm a high ranking black belt. I don't do it, you know, much these days. But I used to teach classes of over two hundred people. I was what was called Dai Senpai, which means top student in the class. I used to go to tournaments and anyway, that's that's. When, when did, when, were you doing that the whole time you were doing all of this stuff? Yeah, I started karate when I was about um, fifteen. 
So you, know? you were doing it the whole time. You were doing all everything on and off, else. On and off. off. On and off. On and off. So you, know, you were always in good shape then, anyway. Yeah, I was. Really I try yeah. to stay in good shape. Yeah. You know, but you know, the, the whole. If you look me up on 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 Wikipedia, you'll see a little more about yeah. some of the, some of my karate history. I. It's not just you know Taekwondo with nothing against that style, but Gojiru, which is hard soft style, is one of the three most traditional styles of karate in the world. And I started. I studied with three of the most influential, legendary. Sensei, which means karate instructor or teacher, mm -hmm. in the entire history of our planet. So I was just very fortunate. We didn't really get into the, any of that because we we're talking about music. We're getting into it right now. Yeah. So you did it a little bit in LA. You moved to Florida. Right. Uh, when did you, but for the people that didn't know, um, he is an attorney. And uh, we just right. to touch on it before we close, I want to tell you you moved to Florida. Is this where your parents were, by the way? Did your parents come here to retire? Yes, they did. Did you come after they came here to retire? Um, I, I moved here, yeah, around, yeah. I'm, no, they moved here maybe a year or so, a year or two before I came here. I came here full-time in 96 to start law school at, at Nova, Shepherd Broad Law Center. At so Nova in Fort you Lauderdale. decided you wanted to go back to law school. How many years did you have to spend there? Uh, Three years, full-time law school. Like I said earlier in our interview, I planned on law school since I was before But, but college. then you did it. I did it. When I was 38, after Sabbath, after eight years in L.A., I'm like, it's his time. I'm going to law school. It's time for me to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to get too old and tired. I am doing this. This is something that, that it's in my heart. I want to do. I want to help other people. I want to support the law and the United States. And what makes us a civilization is law. That's what holds us together as a, as a people, I as a country, that. and as a civilization. And, yeah. and what type of law did you, or do you practice or have you practiced? I do, I do, right now I do civil, uh, personal injury, I do contracts, although I, I did do some defense work. You know, when I first came out of law school, I was a second career guy, I didn't have any time to waste, so I did work for insurance companies as defense attorney, mm -hmm. fighting those cases, but then I eventually switched over to the plaintiff side, and I've been doing that over 24 years now. And so you've been here for quite a while here in South Florida. So you kept playing. You've always been playing. I've known you yes. for, for several years, maybe 15, maybe years plus. Right, over when 15 I first years. Met with, when you were with Rick Bauer, I think I first met with you. Right. Let's talk about, before we close the house, I want to talk about what you have going on today. Um, if anybody, uh, you're, you're still practice, um, but you don't practice full time, correct? Yeah, I'm practicing a, a little more part time these days because I'm concentrating a little more on music. Plus, I, you know, my mother was sick. I had to care for my mom. We had the pandemic, so you know, life made a few changes for me. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm full back in music right now. Uh, I've got War Pigs going, which is my Black Sabbath tribute band. Yeah, I was going to touch on that too. Wait, yeah. wait, if if someone wanted to use Use, would we want to solicit your service or, or tell anybody how they can get a hold of you if they're interested in your legal services? How yeah, would can, they get a hold of you? You just go to the Florida Bar site. You can find my information right on there. Dave Spitz. Okay. Just David, a, David M. Spitz. It doesn't say the beast, does it? No, it does not say the beast. <laughs> not on the Florida Bar okay, site. Okay, real quick, War Pigs. I've seen Warpigs. several versions. I, I've been watching you play with all kinds of cats. You know, Patrick Hansing, Rick Bauer. I saw you play with... Uh, What's his name? The other cat uh, that you just mentioned. Eric English. Yeah, Eric English. Right, right. And all these different players. Yes. Right now, at this moment, I saw your lineup on the air. And I love Dewey, by the way. Something about Dewey. See, I Dewey's mean, man. my man. And he's such a. He's great. You, you meet him in person, you wouldn't. He just doesn't seem like, you know, yes. he would be that guy. Yes. But when he gets behind a kit, he's just masterful. I turned him into a monster. You will, once again, yes. you did it again, because yes. he is fucking great. Because that's what uh, I do. When I play with people, I try to make them better and then make me push better. Push them, push them. And make yes. the songs better and make the show better. Andy Mendez, yes. good fit. He's got that Aussie style. Yes. He's also a good guitar player, a great guitar player. Oh, he does not play guitar in War Pigs. Well, I hope not. He only sings. Because none of the singers because did. I, I do not play with two guitar players. I, I hear you there. I, I got to get rid of my other guitar player. I yeah, want yeah. that space. I use that space to, to use it or leave it. But well, that guitar player, the, the cat that you picked up from that Maiden yes. tribute band. What's a his name? Anthony Alfano. The Ant-Man. I like that. The Ant-Man. Let me, let me let also me tell say you something. That. I love Anthony. He is the greatest communicator. We talk every day. We text. Really? He's super fucking motivated. I love him. I'm, I'm trying to get everybody else 
to be as motivated for him. He fucking started texting me at 7.30 this morning. Uh, I, I have to tell him, dude, the beast is not <laughs> at fucking 7.30. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, Go on. Uh, and before we close, I want to say that... <laughs> yeah, we got to get a seen, plug going there. I've seen hundreds of bass players in my lifetime. I have my own favorites, you know. I have yeah. the, the ones that I enjoy listening to. And people don't realize in your era of growing up and, and, and how prominent how, how big of a part bass playing was in that era i right. mean the last you know the last you know 10 15 20 years bass players are mostly pocket players they play by the pattern or back in that day the bass was just held everything together guitars were prominent but if you had a rhythm section a monster rhythm section when i yeah. go hear you pl- go hear you play there's that old school where it's just growling at the note you know yeah. it's not just this Right. It's known where to play, where not to play, mm-hmm. how to listen to what goes on around you. Yeah. And I notice that you're having a lot of fun. Yeah. Now, here you are, a guy who's played in front of tens of thousands of people. Hundreds. And you're playing at, I won't say any names, you're playing at a place down the street. Or should we say name? Yeah. But playing down the street in front of 20, 30 people, and you're playing like you're playing in front of thousands of people. You're just playing at it. You're moving around. You're looking at people. You're communicating. Yes. You're badass, bro. And it's our pleasure well, I appreciate to have that. you. I appreciate you got to do it. Bad, let, me t- yeah. look, let me tell you something, and, and let, let us end on this note. For all the fucking players and musicians, it doesn't matter how many fucking people you're playing for. You never know who's going to be out in the crowd. I say that all when the time. When you get on fucking yep. stage, you play your fucking heart out. Like you never ever played before. Yep. When I get up there, I do it. I love it. It's all about the people and the music for me. I'm not making any money from these local war pig shows. Yeah. I'm not even going to tell you. I spent almost as much money or more rehearsing for the show I have Friday <laughs> than what they're Welcome fucking, to my world. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm being serious. Yeah. This, you know, look, I've had plenty of gigs where they're paying you money back in the day in the 80s. Yeah. That doesn't exist unless someone calls me to do like a full blown tour. Yeah. Okay. We're not going down that road. Yeah. We're talking about local. I do this because I love Sabbath. I love the people. I love my friends. I love you guys. Yeah. Jimmy, you and I have jammed a bunch of times. Yeah. I know you and your family for many years. We rehearse yep. at your facilities. Okay. I do this because this is in my fucking blood. Absolutely. If you came to my house, we're at your house. If you came to my house, you wouldn't believe it. I got over 170 bases, 50 fucking amps. <laughs> you can't even walk in the fucking place. Hey, listen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if someone, yeah. if someone wants to get a hold uh, or find out more about War Pigs and where you're going to play, can they just go to a Facebook page? Is that simple? Yeah, I'm not on Facebook because somebody hacked me personally, but War Pigs Official is on there. Okay. You can go on there. We're playing at Piper's this Friday. We got a lot of people coming down. We're going to have some other shows coming up. Like I said, I do it for the love of, of people and for the fans. And I hope you, you continue to come, you know, watch us play because we do a really nice job on the Sabbath stuff. People really enjoy it, man. It's a lot of fun. A lot. We're going to have you back because a lot of people. Uh, we only got to. Jimmy. Uh, see, we've only been here two hours. Listen. <laughs> we listen, only got to half of my I, fucking I, I want shit. you to know that Karen sent me, uh, your friend Karen, our, our friend Karen. My best friend who, Karen. Who loves you. My best friend and Karen. And I've never seen a happy female. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. I've never Happy seen birthday. a female it's her go to that Saturday. many. I, and listen, I've never seen a woman go to this many shows in my life. I don't know what she does for it's a living. It's unbelievable. She, but she's a great lady, and she had a bunch of questions. Okay. And she told me what to not touch on. Far away. And she, <laughs> well, first of all, uh, she said, uh, well, to, these are ones that I can't even touch on because they're dirty. She got dirty, a little, yeah, yeah, she got a little bit dirty. She really, really? loves you. Let me see. I here. love Karen well, she, so much. First, first of all, she's we, my we, best buddy in the fucking world. And she is. well, happy birthday to her. Happy and, birthday, Karen. Happy birthday. And she just reminded me that you do like scotch. I love Real scotch. Real quick before we leave, I finished what you gave no, me. No, no, I got you. I got you a whole other food refill. Okay. Hey, what is your favorite scotch? Uh, actually, I have quite a few that I like. Throw one out there. If you had a um, choice, you were on your dying bed right now, and you need your last drink. You know, I'll tell you, my 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 other friend Scott just got me. This really nice new single malt scotch. It's called Aran, Aran, A R R A N, which is really nice. It's a Highland. You know, it's either Highland, that, Jason? Speyside, or Islay. Get me going on scotch. We'll spend another okay, hour. Okay, so if you're if it's your last meal 
and uh, you wanted to sit down and have your last meal. Yeah. You're, you're, you're on your way out. What's your last meal? Steak and potatoes, fish, uh, lobster. Uh, Probably uh, fucking some Aaron scotch, some lobster, and... Uh, a good steak or no? Yeah, you know what? A big red meat? I do. I like red meat. Italian food. I love Italian. I love it. I've had, I've been to these fancy fucking state steak houses right. lately where they rip you off for $92 for a steak yeah. and they never do it right. They suck. I've given up. I've fucking okay, given up, up on that shit. <laughs> and I, I love everybody, the people that take me out. God bless them. You know, they're spending like $1,000. We went there last week with some friends. Well, I, I, I first, much, uh, look, you know what we like? Zuccarellos. You know what Zuccarellos yeah, is? Yeah, Zuccarellos. Yeah, yeah. Commercials. Yeah. Commercial. Zuccarellos. Yeah. I go there with my buddy David Lovett once a month. We go there all the time. Do you do, do, do sushi? Love sushi to death. Okay. Love sushi. I'm going to invite you to my favorite sushi place. Which place? No, don't. I'm not, I can't say it. Oh, okay. Unless they want me to sponsor it. Say it. What no, 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 listen. <laughs> I'm going to take you to my favorite uh, sushi place, and I love you for being here today. Thank what you, a Jimmy. pleasure. The energy We're that you do have. We're going to do it again. For the story sure. that you have. Absolutely. Love you, And we guys. appreciate you. Jason Sedewey. Thanks for sitting through this. This is the longest right. interview we've had. Yep. We've been here for uh, two, three months. And it was worth every minute. Everybody, Absolutely. sound check. Thank right now, Robinette. Dave, Dave, Dave the Beast Smith. Yeah. Amazing. Jason Sudowy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. And we appreciate you tuning in. Dave, thank Take you again, care. bro. Thanks for watching, man. Appreciate All it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.